Um, well, welcome to the stream. This is Diagnose Your Chess. I'm, I am Kostya Kavutsky. I am one of the coaches on coachess.com. This is a weekly show I do on Chess24 where I basically just analyze uh, games and, and I give people advice and unsolicited opinions on their chess and chess improvement. Hey, what's up, Counter Sparks? Um, so we're going to be continuing the viewer game analysis for this week. Uh, which means if you guys have a game that you want to get analyzed, it could be a tournament game or online game, um, something that you would like to take a look at, uh, I think we'll try to keep it a little bit shorter, meaning we won't look at the whole game, but maybe we'll look at one critical moment if you have a question on, or I can briefly go through the game and, and try to just pick out one interesting moment that I think could be could be instructive for the stream. All right, so this was a rapid game, and I think our student here is playing black. So let's flip the board. And uh, I didn't mention this, but I do have a rule. You're not allowed to submit games that you won, guys. So very important. If you submitted a game that you won, I'm not going to look at it. <laughs> so it got to be games where we lost or we drew. Um, because too many people submit their, their brilliancies, and <laughs> that's not what this show is about. Um, so Dr. Chainsaw says the interesting thing happened on move 24. Let's just quickly go through the game just to get a sense of what happened. Looks like we're playing the, the modern defense. Very, very interesting. Okay, now more of a, more of a hippo style opening. All right, H3. And we're definitely in big trouble as, as black here in this position, but looks like we kind of get out, we get our king safe. And let's see, c5 here, here, takes here, knight f5, queen takes f6, bishop takes f6. So here's move 24, rook takes f5, white one, queen e2, and now apparently black is winning if we just take the bishop. <laughs> so king king d7 was played and then queen e7 and white won this way interesting so okay dr chain so let me ask you something so when you think about this game how would you describe the narrative of this game like what happened in this one how would you explain it like in your mind is this game just oh this is a game where i blundered made at the end or is there was there more to it was there more that happened because this could be useful in terms of how we think about our own games psychologically and what we can take away from from them. This was a rapid game, 15, 15 plus 5. Yeah, because of course there's more to a game than, than just what, what happens you know, at the end. We can all blunder something in, in time trouble, but the interesting thing is to kind of try to analyze what happened. So Dr. Chainsaw says, I was being crushed positionally, but made a queen sacrifice and flipped the initiative. Yeah, that is kind of what happened, right? It's like white was doing really, really well. And then the game uh, shifts right when it seems like, okay, white is just like breaking through. Uh, but here on knight f5, black finds this actually very cool resource. Queen takes f6, bishop takes f6. Rook takes f5. And all of a sudden the bishop on f6 is hanging and main on f1 is hanging. So now white is actually scrambling because black is about to have two rooks for a queen. And uh, materially speaking, that's that's definitely uh, quite good for the two rooks. And the two rooks are just really aiming at this uh, f1 square. And white's king actually looks in like in huge trouble. Yeah, guys, if you want to submit uh, games for a quick review, just whisper to Chess Dojo Live. And you can do that by um, just clicking uh, clicking on the username there in the Twitch chat. And uh, you should have the option to, to whisper there. 
Um, so interesting, yeah, as soon as the game shifts, unfortunately we <laughs> end up blundering here. I imagine you're in time pressure at this point because it's a rapid game. Um, but yeah, let's talk about actually, let's talk about this opening a little bit. I mean, this is one that we really have to be careful here as black because we often end up down a lot of space and in general I don't love openings where we're like not really castling like the king is on e8 and we're playing h5 and this to me it's a tough position to play as black because you're basically just waiting for white to open up the center and like best <laughs> best case scenario you castle queenside where your king is also not that safe so in general I typically prefer openings where like we're just getting castled and at least your king is safe and then you know your plan will depend on the position sometimes you play on the king side sometimes you play on the queen side in a lot of openings you know you play in the center but the important thing is that you're not kind of like handicapping yourself by playing with your king on e8 because it's always tough to play not just because your king is in the center and if the center opens up your king is going to be in danger but also because by playing with the king in the center you're leaving your rooks disconnected and tactically that's always going to be a little suspicious you know because like as soon as the position opens up, not only is your king in the center, but white's rooks are going to have a lot more mobility. And so it's not surprising that white is able to just play like f5 and is already just ready to like break through and in black's position here is already very dire. So my advice would be to think about switching this one up um, to something just like a little bit more, just any opening where your king gets castled. <laughs> so there's a lot of Sicilians that can be fun. Uh, where you castle your king. Um, of, I mean, basically you have a, a wide choice of openings, but I would avoid these like kind of tricky lines where the king stays in, in the center. In general, we want to get castled and then and then figure out what to do in the middle game uh, from there. And as white, yeah, normally playing e4, d4, that's, that's good. But as black, I mean, it's a little bit tougher because we have to fight against the opponent's uh, initiative. Um, but that would be my main takeaway from this game, just seeing it briefly, because, yeah, we these positions are really, really tough to play when, again, we're just kind of fighting against the opponent's initiative. Even if occasionally we're able to kind of scramble and, and survive, even in this position, like, white's initiative is seems quite quite serious. So, yeah, that would be my, my little bit of advice to just try to find a line where at least your king is getting castled and you can still play sharp, adventurous openings, you know, like... Uh, the dragon and the night orf, these are still like really, really fun openings. And uh, you can still put a lot of pressure on the opponent, but you know, your king is castled safely and you don't really have to worry about this yourself. Um, okay, Dr. Chainsaw, I hope that helps. Let me check out Twitch. Looks like I got a couple whispers here. Very cool, very cool. All right, next game from Counter Sparks game they lost to national master very cool let's take a look paste pgn here we go all right so here we're playing uh black and the opponent is uh national master so a player rated about 2200 yeah absolutely and let me check in with youtube how's it going youtube <laughs> all right cool so here we go e4 knight of six okay alakine e5, knight, d5, knight, b6, um, c4, d6. I guess it feels like we would play knight, b6 a little bit early here. I would have played d6 first, but <laughs> that's cool. Uh, I don't think it really matters. c4, d6. So this was a slow game. This was a 60 plus 30. So this is a classical uh, time control game. Very cool. So e takes d6, e d6, knight, f3. I think white plays a pretty normal opening here bishop e3 knight c6 knight d2 bishop f6 queen b3 now we go rook b8 okay feels a little slow g4 takes takes g5 bishop e7 castles queen side wow already it looks like white just has like a really nice position and It's up to us to get some counterplay. So a3, knight a6 here, f6. I'm noticing in this game, again, black did not manage to get castled. 
I mean, this is something that I think just in general is going to probably pay off. But yeah, it looks like we were in serious pressure here. And I mean, White just played like a really nice game. Takes rookie one and, and now is it. That went kind of fast, but I think we can kind of see like the writing on the wall already here after knight d4. Uh, a lot of weaknesses in black's position and... Yeah, unfortunately not enough counterplay on the b-file. So let's back it up. Let, let's try to figure out what happened here. I mean, it seems like the problem started um, around... Around this moment when we play like rook b8 and uh, white just gets like massive, massive space advantage. What's your um, experience with the theory in this line? Counter sparks. <laughs> Thanks, Savage Ruffin. I'm glad you find it instructive. Because uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with these alakine positions, so I can't tell you. Actually, I can tell you. I can just look it up myself. I can just look up the theory and tell you <laughs> where you guys deviated. I mean, you know, to be honest, this is usually where I'm looking. I mean, because to me, just first glance, this looks like a game where we got a bad position out of the opening and never managed to um, to come back. And the fact that we didn't c come back is not because like we didn't play well, but actually just this position already after 15 moves, it looks really, really difficult for black. Um, because white just has a bunch of space. He has like the kingside pawn storm just like ready to happen. And the bishop on e7 is just an extremely restricted piece, right? Like it, it's doing very, very little. So this to me seems like uh, an opening problem, uh, especially given that the, the ratings of the two players, you know, is like reasonably high. Like both players, like one player's national master, uh, our student here playing black, I think is about like, I think somewhere in the expert range, like 2000, 2100 or so. Um, and so at this level, if you get like a really like passive position out of the opening and your opponent just like follows up and plays natural moves like d5 and h4, I mean, you, you have to be like a real magician to like <laughs> get your way out of this one. And I mean, j just quickly judging by the game, it feels like black didn't have a lot of chances here. Like white just really played this one well. Um, so Countersparks is saying maybe a c5 push instead of knight c6. Yeah, that's possible. So whenever I have a game where it feels like um, I just didn't even get out of the opening alive, especially with black, then usually I'm just like checking the database and seeing like, well, um, how did how did players play this opening before me? So let's see, bishop e3, knight c6, knight d2. And uh, we follow a theory here. Well, the theory kind of runs out. Um, so yeah, c5 definitely possible here. And this might be this might be the engine's choice as well. Oh, c5 would be a novelty. That would be kind of a cool novelty if you could make that work. So let's take a look. So let's see what happens here after c5. I guess the idea is to put pressure on d4 and play like knight c6. So if white plays, if white plays d5, then I imagine we're playing like knight d7 and bringing this knight to e5. And you're kind of playing this like a Benoni, right? Where you got your diagonal for the bishop and you have the e5 square. And the main thing I think black needs to do here is try to trade off a pair of pieces. So if you can get bishop takes f3 and then bring your knight to e5 and bring your other knight to d7, I think that would be kind of nice, especially if your bishop gets to f6. Um, if white doesn't play d5, let's say he plays knight c3, then I imagine we're just playing knight c6 and kind of piling on to the pressure uh, on d4. Yeah, I mean, the alakine, it's a real tricky opening because I, I always feel like it stands on very uh, shaky ground in terms of whether it's theoretically viable. Um, but it's, it's a very playable opening. Like, it leads to positions where even if the engine says, like, white is better, 
you always have your ideas as black and you usually have uh, chances to create some counterplay. Although it definitely isn't my, my favorite opening. Now another option I'm seeing is possible is to give up the bishop on f3. That's kind of interesting actually. Let's say you wanted to simplify your life and on h3 you just took here. This is kind of a common idea where you take on f3 and then you just like put pressure on d4. And yeah, the idea is that now your pieces are all like coordinated, like you'll castle, you'll play bishop f6, and you're just trying to get white to push d5 so that your knight can use one of these squares uh, in the center. And then the other knight on b6 maybe comes back to d7 and then tries to get to the c5 or the e5 square. So this might be actually kind of like a simpler way to play and just quickly judging by my stockfish here, totally reasonable. Um, so maybe this is this is one worth checking out. Hey, what's up, Gary? <laughs> it's actually just like a basic Logitech webcam, but I'm using like a special feature where it just blurs the background. <laughs> but I'm glad, glad it looks, seems like a total professional camera. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, if you want to submit games, you'll have to whisper to Chess Dojo Live. I'll type in the Twitch account or on the Twitch chat. Um, there is a bit of a line. I think there's maybe five, six people waiting, but feel free to submit games. I'm trying to go through them. Um, somewhat faster than I usually do just to see like one or two interesting moments and um, and, and just quickly extract some some instructive value from that <laughs> that's funny Gary just just download Nvidia broadcast that's what I'm using it's very easy Nvidia broadcast okay webcam diagnosed um, next one comes from Dripman and curious about move 13 for white wanted to play a move but couldn't make it work turns out computer loves it love to know what you think you should see before playing knight f5 yeah great question Dripman I, I, I love questions like this because they're they're so useful like we often see possible ideas during the game and we don't know if, if it's going to work or not um, and one of the best things you can learn from stronger players is just understanding like what do you need to calculate and what kind of what do you need to see in advance before making some kind of risky move so yeah let's check out this game all right here we go so our student is playing white and they were wondering about the 13th move so we get open Sicilian here e6, knight c3, a6, so Taimanov with, with a6, although well, technically Taimanov is with queen c7, um, bishop e3, d5, d5 is a weird move this early because when white takes, takes, black is left with this isolated queen pawn, and this isn't a particularly good version of it for black. In fact, I would say white stands pretty comfortable here because we have full control over the d4 square. So bishop d3, knight f6, castles. Yeah, now we don't even have to castle queenside. We can just make normal developing moves. h3, castles, queen f3, knight to b4, bishop f5, bishop takes f5. And here's the moment where we have to make a decision. Aha, uh -huh. either queen takes f5 or knight takes f5, which... Um, leaves the c2 pawn undefended. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that this was the dilemma. <laughs> if you take with the queen, everything is protected. If you take with the knight, it looks active, but you do leave the c2 pawn hanging. So I'm gonna try not to look at the engine here and just try to tell you uh, my honest thoughts um, as to what I would think during the game. Let's, let's clear the arrows. Okay, cool. So, yeah, knight takes f5 is of course the move we want to play, which I think you understand because uh, this keeps the knight really active and the knight on f5 is this kind of like classic piece. It combines really, really well with a queen on the g file hitting g7. Of course, there is no queen g4 or queen g3 in this position. 
Um, the problem, of course, is knight takes c2, we, we do give up the pawn, and then it hits the rook as well. And the question is, can we calculate here to make it work? So knight takes f5, knight takes c2. I mean, yeah, there's ideas, there's lots of, there's lots of stuff to calculate. Um, unfortunately, the queen can't use the g-file because g4 is covered and g3 is covered. My first thought would be a move like bishop g5 or something. Knight takes a1, and then like knight h6 check, king h8. But yeah, it doesn't feel super clear. Knight takes d5. There's definitely a big initiative there for white, but I wouldn't think... Yeah, it's not like immediately apparent that white should be winning. Um, so in uh, what was the time control here, Dritman? Can you, can you quickly let us know? Oh, this is a rapid game. 10 minutes plus 10 seconds. So yeah, we don't have a lot of time to calculate here, so... Not something that we can't just like sit. In a classical game, I would just spend like 10, 15 minutes in this position calculating. And if I found a way to make knight takes f5 work, then I would certainly play it. Um, so let's see if we can find something more convincing. Knight takes f5, knight takes c2. Another move we could try is like rook ad1 there. And black probably takes on e3, and maybe we take with the f-pawn, and we say that the pressure on the d-file is pretty annoying. I mean... That is definitely a possibility um, as well. Let's see, knight f5, knight takes c2. What else can we find? Knight takes g7 is always a move, but king takes g7. Bishop to d4 doesn't work, right? We have the knight on c2 there still. Maybe again we go bishop g5, knight takes a1, then knight takes d5, then knight takes g7. Takes d5 is a very annoying move as well there yeah it's pretty tough i i can't say i would um i definitely wouldn't just like immediately you know confidently play knight takes f5 to me it looks pretty unclear in a bullet game like i probably play knight takes f5 because i like playing for the initiative but <laughs> with a little bit of time to think about it you know i i can definitely see see the problem here hmm. yeah not so easy well, all right, let's see, let's see the solution. So knight takes f5. Let's see what happens on knight takes c2. Okay, so the engine goes bishop to g5. So we guessed the right move. Let's say knight takes a1. This isn't given, <laughs> probably because it's pretty bad. Um, but let's try to figure out why. So knight takes d5. And uh, yeah, when I was thinking about this position, I saw bishop e5 here. And I was like, yeah, it looks very promising, but I'm not like, not like 100% sure. Um, the engine finds this move, rook to d1. And once you see rook to d1, now you start to feel pretty nice about your position because like the queen on d8 is hanging. We have all these threats like knight e7 check, knight takes f6. Uh, the queen doesn't really have a ton of good squares because we're about to, um, for example, let's say queen a5. I think we can give the check or just like take on f6 a bunch of times and then give a check. Um, like let's say, let's say check king h8. And then if we take, for example, this would be one checkmate that we play for. Or excuse me, I guess in, in this position it would be it would be criminal not to take with the queen. Sorry about that. Yeah, you definitely take with the queen <laughs> if you have this chance. Um, this might not be forced, but this this is like an idea that might immediately show up. I guess if I saw rook to d1 in my calculation, then I would be like, oh yeah, this looks great. Let's let's just do it. Like no way black can survive this. And you have to consider also in like a blitz and a rapid game. In general, it's harder for the defender in these kinds of positions because they have to deal with so many tricks. Who knows, let's say black had like an only move here to survive, it would be very, very difficult to find for, for any human being. Um, so there is a sense of value coming from the initiative. Now in terms of whether you should have seen all this and, and confidently play knight takes f5, that's a tough call. I mean, I think a lot of players would play this move just kind of uh, on principle, like it's the active move in the position and, and they believe in their attack. Um, let's see, I wonder if we can try something else like rook ad1 here, this would be a little bit more measured, like we're not sacrificing as much material. It seems like here, I mean, we have a reasonable uh, amount of initiative, let's say knight takes e3, I think you could take either way, but let's just say pawn takes, 
So something like this, I would feel is also giving white some amount of play because you have the rook on, on the d file and black has to deal with this. Um, but yeah, bishop g5 felt like the, the critical move, at least to me, just because you start setting up this pin, you get these knight takes d5 ideas, and, and that looks pretty dangerous. Let's say, for example, after knight takes um, a1, we just played rook takes a1. Let's take a look at this position. Let's just say we capture the knight. We only sacrifice the exchange. Yeah, then the engine doesn't really like it for us, as bishop b4 is possible. Uh, maybe bishop e5 is also possible. So it wouldn't be that good. Sometimes in these positions, like, okay, you just take the knight and you have a ton of compensation here. It's not so clear. So you really have to be uh, precise. So I guess when we're analyzing with the engine, um, what we want to do is get a sense of like, how easy was this to, to find? Uh, and if there's only like one small series of moves that uh, is suggested by the engine as winning and you have to find like five only moves and then you're winning, then that's not that's not really like a very accurate line. But in some positions, you know, it's like every move wins. All of a sudden you have three or four different promising continuations and uh, those are the positions where like, okay, I guess it's, it's not just this one line that the engine finds, but it actually just seems like a strong position. So that's kind of what we're trying to um, determine. So let's see. Oh, so in this position, we have knight takes d5 and rook d1 is also pretty good. And on knight c2, yeah, basically you have to find bishop to g5. So this doesn't really scream out to me as a line that's like super easy to, to calculate. So I'm going to go ahead and let you off the hook for this one. This isn't something where, because sometimes you sacrifice some material, you sacrifice a pawn, then you just get this like very, very clear attack, right? And it's like all your ideas are clear and you have multiple options. Here it's like you have to see bishop g5, you have to find knight takes d5, and then on bishop e5, like this was the most natural line, you had to see either rook d1 here or rook e1, which is given by the engine. But rook e1 isn't that amazing because after bishop takes b2, I believe the engine's number one move here uh, is going to be rook d1. Yep, rook d1 is the only move in this position that gives one an advantage. So you basically have to see this one idea to make it work. Some players would just play knight f5 and then once they get here, I mean rook d1 would be a, an obvious candidate move once you're at this position. But then of course you're taking a risk and, and how much risk you want to take during the game is up to you. If you believe in the initiative, you believe you should have something, then I, sh I, I believe in taking the risk. But if it really looks unclear and you're about to go down a lot of material, then, I mean, queen takes f5 is, is a practical decision, especially in uh, Blitz and Rapid. Though in a classical game, I would encourage you to spend a lot of time here and really try to make knight takes f5 work. So I hope that uh, was helpful. I think this is a really interesting example. It's always easy to say, like, after the fact, you know, like, oh, yeah, of course you should see this and you should just remember that you should always play the best move in every position. <laughs> it's like, no, during the game, you never know if what you're seeing is, is accurate. Um, yeah, it's like the difficulty is finding one string of moves and it's like they're not exactly forced. Um, but yeah, really, really useful example. I would say this one is definitely on the edge. Some positions it's like, okay, you sacrifice some material and then you get to a position where it's like you have multiple good options in those positions, you should always take the plunge and just trust yourself that at the right moment, you'll find one of the several good options. But if you're walking like a very thin tightrope on your way to the win, then that's kind of a recipe for disaster. Very easy to mess it up. So yeah, hope that, uh, yeah, I'm glad that was useful. Um, okay, let's jump to another game. So let's see. Next up, I have Julio, and then I got one from uh, Savage Mump. Uh, Muffin and uh, Dan K. Palumbo. You guys are up next. Um, and then it seems like the line is open, assuming I didn't miss any. So if uh, other folks want to submit games, you can submit them by whispering to Chess Dojo Live on Twitch. I just wrote something in the Twitch chat. And uh, yeah, you can click and whisper. Um, Sach17, yeah, I don't see your game. Um, so you'll have to you'll have to whisper it again. I don't I don't know why, but it just it just doesn't show up uh, for me. But I'll I'll try to get you in if you can uh, if you can submit it. 
Okay, Julio. Let me download this game. So Julio, was there one moment in this game that you had a question on or am I free to just look through it and, <laughs> and see what I find? Looks like this was a rated classical game and both players are right around 2100. Very cool. Strong players. I won't be able to just like make stuff up randomly. <laughs> Okay, the opening was similar to the one I did a video on. Okay, cool. Let's check it out. So here Julio is playing black. And, um, oh, we got a King's Indian. Yeah, yeah, I know this line. All right, well, <laughs> let's take a look. I'm a big King's Indian guy. So, yeah, happy to analyze this one. Love the King's Indian. It's just such a good opening. Just such a good opening. Except against like really strong players. I mean, they're they're good at crushing it. But if you're not like playing against, you know, IMs and GMs regularly, it's like perfect opening. <laughs> um, oh, right. I wanted to see if I got another whisper. Hmm. No, I'm not getting it. Um, Satch 17. Are you sure you're whispering it to to Chess Dojo Live? I don't know why. I see everyone else's, but yours doesn't doesn't show up for me. Yeah, maybe if you can whisper it to like another user or someone in the chat, maybe they can help you out or something. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to make it happen. Um, okay, but let's um, let's take a look at this one. Bishop e2. So yeah, this is um, starts off as an Averbach, but then white plays bishop e3. So I think this is known as um, the, I think this is like a semi Averbach. And a lot of times white's idea uh, with this early bishop e2, basically to control the g4 square and, and push a quick g4. So this can be a very aggressive system where white plays like g4, h4, h5, and then like queen d2. And tries to castle queen side. So black has to be really, really careful here. In general, against these lines where white plays for this like early g4 or like h3, g4 and all these positions, um, I personally have always liked systems with knight a6 and keeping this diagonal open. And the reason for that is like, well, if white is gonna be castling queen side, like if this is what the opponent wants, I mean, this is what they're indicating, right? They wanna go g4, h4, castle queen side and checkmate you. Well, then I think it makes sense to keep the diagonal open and keep your bishop open and not play e5 uh, unless it like really makes sense to do so and you're sure you can get counterplay. There are lines in the Averbach where black goes e5, d5 and, and they're absolutely playable. But in general, if white is going to be castling queen side, I want to just keep the position flexible so that if they you know play g4 super early, then we can play a move like c5 and, and get this kind of uh, Benoni position. I think the way to be a successful Kings Indian player is to be willing to play different kinds of structures. That means like Benoni structure, that means like the E5 structure, uh, maybe even throwing in like some Banco Gambit ideas if, if you feel like it's appropriate to play B5 or if you think it's gonna work. Like being able to borrow from different openings in the Kings Indian is really important because there's so many positions where I think like going into a Benoni uh, type of position is actually the way to go. And already this one I think is an interesting way for black to play. Um, for example, you can go e6 here and your idea is just to counter attack in, in the center. And this is not like an easy position for white to play. I mean, they're getting a lot of space on the king side, but they're very far away from actually opening a file and checkmating black. So you can absolutely play this position and, and play against um, the white king in the center and just looking to open the center um, and getting counter play that way. Uh, 
Um, actually, Mr. Soch17, if you can post an FEN code, you can post that in the chat. Um, I could just plug that in. So that would just be like one position. So if you have like one position you want to ask a question on, that would be an easy way to do it. Just have to find the FEN code and then I'd be able to load it in on my end. Um, and then I can like make moves on it and, and stuff. Um, so Julio, this is this is kind of how I like to play these positions. Um, I actually, I think I did, I think I did a video on my YouTube channel. Um, I had a game in the World Open where I played this move here, and it was like a really tricky move and and really really strong, <laughs> if I can say so myself. Um, so if you check out my YouTube channel and find that game, you can find uh, analysis to this one because I think this is kind of a, a cool idea. So this is how I would personally approach the opening, um, but let's let's go through the game because e5 d5 I think this is absolutely fine. Um, a5 now white goes f3, and I'm not sure if f3 is really uh, needed here actually as white I would imagine g4 is the idea. I mean this is the whole point of starting with bishop e2 so that you can possibly save a tempo on f3 and you don't necessarily have to play it. So from white's point of view f3 is kind of a strange move. Um, and now from black's point of view, maybe you could have taken advantage of this one by playing knight h5 here. This is like a very typical idea in these kinds of positions where we're just trying to play knight f4, even if it's uh, possibly a, a pawn sacrifice, and uh, the pawn sacrifice will open up the bishop. So especially if white castles queenside, and we get knight f4 in, and, and white takes twice, we open up the bishop, we get tons and tons of compensation on the diagonal, the knight comes to c5, and we get lots of play. So this might have been one way to kind of take advantage of what white is doing here. The other idea behind this move, of course, is to play f5, um, which is uh, an important way that black gets counterplay uh, in these positions. So for example, if white plays like g3, I think you could go just f5 here and, and get some reasonable play. And then from here, we're developing like bishop d7, knight a6, queen e7, kind of like normal stuff. Okay, great, 17. Yeah, I'll, I'll check out your, your FEN next. Um, so, yeah, one idea whenever white allows uh, this early knight h5, this is often useful. So, knight a6, g4, knight c5, h4. Uh, now we go h6. That's kind of interesting. I would also consider h5 in these positions. I would strongly consider h5. Actually, I think h5 was the move. Um, because if white goes g5, then they're kind of closing down their attack, and you're now you're safe as black. I think you can go knight d7 here, maybe knight e8, just to keep the bishop open, because it's so hard for white to open anything up here, and if they play f4, this is going to be like a terrible decision, because this the only thing this does is just like it opens up your bishop on this diagonal, and, and now I would already take black here. I think you're, you're doing really, really well. Um, and, and you're the one actually with the pawn break. You're the one that's going to play like <laughs> f6 and, and open things up. Not to mention you can already like take on c3, take on e4, but that's not even not even needed here. Um, so this is a structure that I think you would be quite okay with. Um, what to do after bishop g5? Yeah, fair enough. Bishop g5 uh, seems like a, a pretty critical response. Usually the move is just to like unpin. So I would try queen e8. And then I guess if takes takes here, this is I'm not sure if this is what you're worried about, but this is a pawn you can almost always sacrifice. You go king g7, and if they take take, you have this like fantastic dark squared bishop, and your rook is coming to h8. So you're just you're doing amazing here. This is just like excellent for black. So like queen e7, you're just taking over the dark squares for one pawn. It's like just beautiful compensation. Let's see, bishop g5, queen e8. I mean, white doesn't have to take on f6, but usually that's what we're worried about. But yeah, that's that's a pawn we're happy to sack. Queen d2 is probably stronger, something like this. Um, but then you can just like continue like bishop d7. And these positions aren't like a ton of fun. It does feel like we're kind of stuck. But well, this is why I don't love playing e5 in these positions, because this is often what happens where it's like you're not quite getting mated. But you, you are definitely feeling squeezed on the king side. So white is def definitely still better here, but you have your chances for counterplay. Like a4, you have your like knight b3 check ideas and, and c6 and, and stuff like that. 
yeah so the pawn sack that's fine but this kind of position not exactly the most fun it can be hard for for black to get their their counterplay here so this is this is what we want to be careful about yeah um but h6 is interesting because uh well it, it, what white should do here is they should play h5 and then you're probably forced to go g5 and you don't get checkmated here but you do give up the f5 square and so strategically this is this is a big problem for black um so you're not going to lose this position in the next like 15 moves but <laughs> what white needs to do is just like bring their knight to uh g3 and then f5 and then you'll probably have to take it it'll be hard to tolerate it then white will take e takes f5 and then put their other knight on e4 it's just not going to be a fun position your bishop on g7 is going to be dead the whole time um, yeah, so this is what white probably should have done, but he goes g5, and now knight h5, takes, and bishop f6, beautiful. Yeah, so this is like a similar uh, similar pawn sack to what we were just looking at, where, okay, you give this one pawn, but you get bishop f6, and now you're like winning all the uh, dark squares on, on the king side. So bishop f2, c6, queen d2 here. Takes, takes, d7. Yeah, I think you played it uh, very reasonably. Knight h5. So, knight h5. Hmm, knight h5 is not bad, but <laughs> I, I get the feeling that you played knight h5 because you didn't want white to take on f4. <laughs> but uh, as we mentioned earlier, you actually do want white to take on f4. You, you know, you're you would happily give up this pawn as a king's Indian player in order to open up your dark squared bishop, especially when white's king is on b1. You see, the bishop can actually point at b1. It doesn't have to... <laughs> but that's how strong the bishop is, right? It, it just points directly at, at, at white's king. Um, so the right move here was basically just like leaving your knight on, on f4 and just like daring white to take it. Because the knight on f4, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a very strong piece, right? It doesn't let white play knight h3, puts pressure on all these squares. So you don't want to just back it up and, and give away your, your nice outpost. So something like a3 here, I think, is the way that black should be playing, right? Just playing to, to create some weaknesses. Now white goes b3. I mean, can you imagine if white ever takes on f4? You know, they're just, you're just going to play queen e7, back the bishop up, they're going to get checkmated in like five moves. Um, or you can play a, a move like b5 here, which is a very typical idea in these kinds of positions, where, yeah, you leave one pawn hanging on f4 and you offer white a second pawn on b5. Because as my friend Jesse Cry likes to say on the uh, Chess Dojo Live Twitch account, pawns are not people, right? So it's all about the pieces. And you're happily giving up a pawn here just to open up your pieces against white's king. We want our bishop opened up against uh, the b2 pawn, and we want our rook opened up on the b file. So this this was the way to, to play. Because um, we're opposite sides castling, right? So we're playing for, playing for the initiative here. So let's see what happens. So knight h5, yeah, kind of unnecessary, although, I mean, still your position is totally fine. Queen a5. I mean, b5 looks great. Bishop f1, b4. Now it seems like black is uh, just in total control. Hmm. Knight b3, nice. It <laughs> doesn't look like you can take the knight. Definitely looks like that knight is safe. So queen e3, white ignores it. Knight f4. Queen b6. Okay, go for the end game. I feel like I've seen this movie before where we have like this really nice attack. Then all of a sudden we trade queens and then it's not so easy. Black's position is still really, really good. Um, so let's see what happened here. This was a 45-45 game, so we might have been approaching time trouble at some point. Julio, what was the time management like in this game? At what point were you in time trouble? So we get this long end game. Oh no, just hang the piece. Yeah, it happens, it happens. It's a, it's a shame. Very interesting game too. I mean, like all the way into the end game. 
but hopefully you're not kicking yourself too much over this. Unless it happens a lot, in which case you should probably think about it. So what was what was the time like at this point? Are you like down to your increment or you still have you still have some time or, or what what was happening here? Julio might not be in the chat anymore. <laughs> okay, kind of a bummer. Um, well, yeah, interesting game. Seems like Black just couldn't quite break through in time. Queen e3. I mean, maybe this was the moment to take on g3 so that White's bishop gets distracted. And White doesn't get to trade queens with queen b6 and then Black can continue the attack. Um, like maybe something like rook c5 here and then like doubling the rooks on the c file and, and trying to to get in this way. It looks like a fantastic position if uh, if uh, we can just keep the queens on. So to me it, it was a bit of a shame that we allowed white to trade queens because now all of a sudden white is not getting checkmated. Still a really nice endgame for black. I think we should win this one. Um, but let's talk about how to convert this one for a bit Let's see so we just leave the rook on c2 i mean this was this was good here and and now white's h pawn is like weak and yeah for some reason we weren't okay with uh trading the rooks you know i think i would have been fine with that but we get rook g2 rook g1 okay finally we trade and yeah, so here we avoid the trade, but this is a tough one because when we avoid this trade, it's like we're just giving white this big, big open file. So it's like, I don't know. I would have definitely thought about taking, say king takes, and now knight c4, I think we can cover with bishop to e7. So let's say, let's say we just take here. We got the extra pawn and the king is super active. I mean, I don't really see, I don't really see like how quick white's counterplay is. Um, Cause we have bishop e7, king g3, we take this one and then our g pawn is just super, super strong. So I don't know, maybe Julio was um, avoiding trades here a little bit too much because now like our rook is is not really active here and so it's not clear why we why we avoided the trade if anything seems like it would make things easier for us then of course the blunder happened i mean even here black's position is still absolutely fine but what can you do blunders are going to happen oh i see julio yeah, yeah, so on queen e3, I think we had to be a little bit more careful here, just realizing, like, right, if white wants to, if white gets the chance, of course, trading queens is going to ease up a lot of pressure. So trying to stop this one would have been, I think, the way to go. But really interesting game overall. I mean, I, I hope I hope people got something uh, out of it. Um, okay, let's go to the next game. And this one is from Savage Muffin. And I think they were playing black in this game. Okay, let's take a look. And this was another rapid game, 15 plus 10. <laughs> 17 you're fed <laughs> I forgot hold on let me let me copy it in all right let's do the fen and then we'll do the game now that we we have it loaded in all right set up position here we go didn't work again apply oh there we go okay this was was this black to move it looks like a Berlin 
Wow, I can't believe we have a Berlin on the show. I think this is our first Berlin. Amazing. All right, Soch17. So what was the question here? All right. Oh, nice. <laughs> okay, Engine hates your move, Rook D. So you played Rook D7. Engine doesn't like it. And you're asking what, what to do instead in the position. Okay, cool. I mean, I, I should be clear. I'm not a... I'm not a Berlin expert, um, so I'm just approaching this kind of like, you know, basic endgame principles. Uh, Rook d7, I mean, definitely looks like a reasonable move. We should note that black cannot castle here, which would be a really good move probably, um, because this came from an opening where the king uh, took on d8, so this is not available to us. I mean, yeah, first instinct say like h5, right, just to like get this counterplay on the h-file. Was this... Was this a move you considered? And if so, was there something you um, didn't like about this move? Because it feels very natural to, let's say, just play h5 and and put the question to the g4 pawn, open up the rook on h3, probably forcing white to take on e6 so we can kind of get things moving along. Um, yeah, let's say they like take on e6 and we take, I think we take with the knight here usually. As far as I know, these positions are supposed to be kind of okay for black um, once we trade off a couple of pieces. Um, I mean, assuming uh, assuming you, you know your opening is still fine, maybe earlier you might have messed up the opening. Again, I'm not like a Berlin exer uh, expert. Uh, 17 says, I think I was fixated too much on theory that black is supposed to keep bishops and that king runs to ca. Oh, interesting. Well... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing we have to be careful when we study theory. It's like just because you play one line in a certain way doesn't mean that that's always going to be the plan you follow up on. You got to be really careful. Now, in these positions in Berlin's, a lot of times you can rely on like typical plans and that's what you're trying to do. So it's good that you have a plan, um, but you don't want to be too mechanical about it. You still want to rely on like um, general chess principles, which is like, you know, just playing for counterplay and, and, and trying to create threats um, and, and things of that nature. I mean, it doesn't really feel like we have a way to uh, keep the light squared bishop. I mean, you could play a move like bishop d5 or something, but you're going to get hit with c4 and, and bishop d5 um, always allows white to get the knight to f5 and get some e6. So this feels like an extremely dangerous move. I don't think you can move the bishop off of e6 while white's bishop is on um, b2 and kind of like policing this diagonal. <laughs> so it seems like we have to be okay with a trade on e6 kind of no matter what. Um, yeah, well, I guess I guess this is something you learned about the endgame from this game. I guess this is something maybe a few people learned. You can trade off the bishop, and I believe there are lines where black does allow uh, the bishop to to get traded off. Um, so, yeah. Now, maybe we, we messed up the opening earlier. I'm not really sure. Like, I'm, I'm just thinking after h5, f3... The problem for us is that this knight on g7 is still kind of like, it's a little uh, passive. But um, but I don't know, this is definitely a, a question for for the database and, and the engines. Okay, and then we the end of the game was an agreed draw. The question is, was I wrong to agree to a draw in this position? Well, we'll see. What was the, uh, what was the time situation? What was the, the clock situation like at this point? Wait, is this the right position? Hold on, what's happening here? <laughs> this is not black to move, right? We have made in one. Seems like it's white to play. Yeah, but why was the game agreed to a draw? with white to move if if he's the one offering a draw then you don't you should be waiting for him to make a move 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you're you're not obliged to accept the draw uh, while it's your opponent's turn. So if he offers a draw, and you just don't, you just ignore it. Um, then they have to make a move, and you can still take the draw. And especially in this position, I mean, you're threatening mate and one. I would, I would especially wait for my opponent to make a move before I uh, I allow a, a draw or not. <laughs> this is a two-hour game, <laughs> but, but no. But the thing is, um, well, the amount of time you have doesn't really matter because it, if it's your opponent's turn, uh, your clock is not running. So you're only offered a draw when it's your turn. Like in general, it, when you offer a draw, you can't just do that on your own move because it doesn't make any sense. You offer a draw, and your opponent just like. Is thinking about it and your clock is ticking down right so the way it works is someone offers a draw and then it's the opponent's turn and then they have to decide whether they want a draw or whether they want to play on and then you have to think on your turn so if it's like your move and you're offered a draw that kind of makes sense right because it's like well if you want to play on then you just make a move and you play on and if you want to take the draw then you take the draw but you're the one that's thinking about it so that should be happening on your time if it's your opponent's turn and they offer you a draw, uh, you're under uh, no obligation to to respond. You just wait for them to make a move, and then you can uh, and then you can uh, decide then. Knight h5 was the move. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, that's a question for your opponent. <laughs> it sounds like they offered a draw because they're about to get checkmated and they didn't know what to do. <laughs> So, yeah, I think this is kind of a weird moment. So, yeah, you definitely don't accept a draw when it's your opponent's turn because they don't know what to do. <laughs> They're offering a draw because they don't know what to do. So uh, you just wait for them to make a move because you're not losing anything. You still have... The way it works is like when you offer a draw and then you make your move, the, the draw offer still stands, right? So you have nothing to lose by just waiting for them to make a move. Because if you're just waiting there, like their clock is ticking down. You understand, right? They offered a draw, but their clock is ticking down. If you're just sitting there, <laughs> they have to make a move eventually, right? Otherwise, you're going to flag. And then it's up to you whether you want the draw or not. So, you know, if they play some random move like knight e6, then you just play rook h1 and you checkmate them. And if they find some tricky move like knight h5, and then you're like, uh-oh, I can't take the knight because rook e8, rook d8 is checkmate then here you might consider taking the draw. And here I wouldn't blame you. Like, it's a really sharp position, and, you know, it's like, who knows what's happening? Is black better? It's very hard to say. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe white goes, like, um, rookie a check. I mean, this seems like the move most players would play, given that black is threatening main. Knight h5 is a hard move to find. Uh, I don't know. I, I wouldn't expect most players to find knight h5 here in, in time trouble. So rook e8, I think, is what would likely happen if your opponent was forced to make a move. And then let's say you take take king d7. I mean, with the two bishops, you have an active king. Like, you're, you're definitely never worse here as black. Whether you want to take the risk is up to you. I mean, I don't know, in general, I believe in, like, just playing it out, because, like, it's all about the experience, you know? I mean, if you're playing for some, like, big prize, right, or some, like, qualification or something, then, yeah, like, maybe take the draw, right, if you have, if you have something to play for. But if all you're playing for is, like, rating points, then, I mean, the experience of playing the endgame is going to be more valuable than the rating points of, like, a guaranteed draw. And chances are, if you play it out, like, you know, I mean, you'll probably make a draw anyway, like... You'll lose some games, you'll win some games, you'll draw some games. Like, your score is not going to be worse than 50%, most likely, given that your position here looks pretty decent with the two bishops. So, um, 
So yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like, you know, a lot of times we want to secure the safe result, but I think in the long run, like you're going to be better off just like playing these things out um, because you'll get better because it's like, I mean, I mean, I, I get the feeling it's like you're under pressure and you don't want to mess it up. But when you do that, you, you, you get more experience and you get better at like playing under pressure. So the more you play it out, the better you get at playing it out. And um, if you want to, you know, let's say like reach your like full potential or whatever, it's like you do have to be willing to like take risks and accept that, you know, some time scrambles you're going to lose. But long story short, if you think your position is good, you should play on. If you think it's equal or if you think it's worse, then, you know, of course you can take the draw. <laughs> but if you think your position is good, objectively, then um, I would I would play on, uh, given that there's nothing else on the line. Obviously, if you're playing for like first place, a draw, you know, guarantees you qualification to the World Cup, then yeah, buddy, like don't be a hero, right? Just take the draw. <laughs> but if it's like a, you know, training game, uh, and you think you're better, then, uh, then you play on. If you're not sure if you're better, then, uh, you know, either way, but, you know, probably I would, I would think that we're not really risking anything. The question is like, you know, are you really risking to lose the two bishops? Probably not so much. Um, but yeah, now if your opponent plays knight h5 and we're at, we're talking about this position, then this position is very tricky, right? Because again, we can't take the knight, our rook is hanging. This, I, I wouldn't blame you at all for taking the draw. This looks very, very tricky. So this, it's like total mess. Yeah, yeah, so we should be clear what we're saying here. If it's like a clear position, you're not really risking to lose, play on. If it's some kind of mess like this, then okay, yeah, you can take the draw. But I mean, you know, in the long run, maybe you would be better off uh, playing out even these dynamic positions uh, as well. Um, okay, well, I hope that helps. Um, let's see, we had a game here that I already loaded in. Let's see if we can find, yeah, here we go. Okay, and this is from Savage Muffin, who I think was asking about the opening, if that's right. Let's see. Don't know how to punish seemingly reckless openings. Okay, let's take a look. So e4, e5, f4, king's gambit. Yeah. So let's see what happens. So looks like white is able to just win back the pawn and now this is like perfect position for white, right? Because they got their big center and they got all their pieces out. They have this open F file. White is doing fantastic. Um, so yeah, definitely the King's Gambit here worked out. White just got their pawn back and then they got everything they wanted from, from the opening. Uh, okay, so there is one idea, Savage Muffin, that I would, I would encourage you to take away. Um, and that is this one, Knight takes E4. So you can do this in many cases, when there's knight on c3, bishop on c4, white takes your knight, and then you're going to hit them with d5, uh, winning your piece back. And this is a pretty typical equalizer in, in a lot of e4 openings because, like, you just grab, you take white's most important pawn, the e pawn, you basically trade it for your d pawn. Both of you guys lose a piece, but that's helpful for you because white, you know, his pawn was already developed. Now you get to develop your d-pawn with tempo, your bishop gets opened up, and this opening of the center, it's kind of nice. It basically, it often equalizes for black, and now white has to figure out like what to do here. Like, If bishop takes d5, you just play queen takes d5, and you're very happy to take their light squared bishop. You'll give them this tempo with knight c3, this is like useless tempo. Your queen can go anywhere here, and basically black is better, because your light squared bishop is really strong. Um, and if white, let's say, drops back, like bishop d3, we take the knight, bishop takes, let's say we castle. I mean, maybe you can even hit them with like f5 or something um, to be super annoying. Uh, but we also have ideas like bishop h4 check. So this doesn't look like a very fun position for white. I think you're the one that's better developed. You're already castled and you have some annoying ideas here. 
like let's say white castles and then you go f5 bishop d3 and it's like i don't know it looks like a strange position for white like how are they gonna how are they gonna develop this guy right we go bishop e6 and then if b3 you'll go bishop f6 and 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 embarrass their rook um so yeah basically this knight takes e4 idea is what um we needed to know castles castles uh we could have played it here as well and the knight takes e4 d5 and again this is just like a clean equalizer for black maybe even more than equalize i mean white still has to win back the f4 pawn and, and that's not exactly uh, a given for them here. So so this is the big idea in these positions. And um, it's why on knight f6, what white needs to do probably is play e5 in order to just like challenge you and not let you get your, your pawn break in um, or your knight takes e4 in. And then I think there's like knight h5 here. Actually, there are a couple moves for black, but I think knight h5 is often the idea. But it's very important from here that you play d6 and you challenge the e-pawn. So that's very, very important to do in these positions in order to get your, your counterplay. Um, and then your knight can come out to c6 and your bishop can come out to g4, and that's kind of the idea. So if you wanna punish your opponent for playing the king's gambit, you really gotta go after their weaknesses. It's not enough to kind of just play somewhat timidly with like d6 and then uh, bishop g4 and just like, just giving the pawn back. Um, here as well probably was the last chance to take on e4 and d5 and again I think black is is not worse here so this would have been the way to go um, I haven't tried the Falkbeer counter gambit I'm not a big theory guy in these positions um, there are lots of lines here you know you can play d6 and g5 knight of six is common bishop e7 I think is, is also playable um, a lot of players like d5 uh, and they like d5 in this position as well. So this is the counter gambit, right, with e4. Um, I mean, maybe this is one to try if you want to If you want to be the one that's, like, fighting for the initiative. But, um, I don't know, you, you got to be careful. You know, you might be running into some sharp uh, sharp theory here. Um, I actually think the way you played it was absolutely fine. It's just, yeah, we need to know this very, very critical knight takes e4 idea. This is This is the big one. This is the big one to know in these positions. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, I see the game was pretty hectic <laughs> from there. Um, I want to try to get to maybe one uh, one or two more games here. Yeah, let's go to Dan. Dan's been waiting. And uh, let's see, we'll get the first moves here. Looks like we got the first 34 moves, Dan, <laughs> if you want to send me the rest. But it looks like Dan's question was about the opening. Oh, that didn't work. No, still didn't work. All right. Dan, you're going to have to... Um, actually, let me just let me just play these moves out because the question was, was about the opening. So here, Dan is playing black. This was a 45-minute game. So the game went d4, c6, c4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, and wait, what does that say? Oh, e6, e3, bishop b4, bishop d2, castles, bishop d3, Bishop d6. Yeah, Dan, we're losing a lot of time in this opening. Bishop d6, castles. Bishop c7. Oh, Dan, this bishop is moving way too many times. You have other pieces too. So queen c2, we take on c4. Bishop takes c4. Knight d5. e4 yeah white takes over the center here we get our one knight to f4 but it's not enough is it white goes e5 the knight has to come back to g6 white goes knight e4 and it's like okay we've seen enough we've seen enough 
<laughs> yeah. So, so already here, white has like a crushing position out of the opening. Uh, basically, it sounds like you just are not sure or not clear how to develop your, your queen side here. Fortunately, Dan, it's very simple. I'll be able to explain it uh, in just a few minutes. Okay, so you gotta, you gotta pay attention. So what you're doing here is you're playing the semi-slav. Um, the move I would play in this position is knight bd7. So this knight almost always goes to d7. This is the most flexible move. And then your bishop will come out to d6 most likely, um, sometimes e7 if, if you really want to. And your other bishop, it's very important, is going to land on b7. So what you're doing here, Dan, is you're waiting for white to move this bishop. As soon as white plays bishop e2 or bishop to d3, let's say they do it in this position, you snap on c4. Because here you, for you force white to spend two moves with their bishop. Your mistake was you're wasting too many times moving the same piece. Bishop b4 and then bishop to d6. There's nothing wrong with bishop to b4, but at least force your opponent to play a3 first to chase you, right? Make a different move, knight d7, and then force him to kick you with a3 so that white spends a tempo kicking you back. So you really got to fight for, for time uh, with your opponent. So you go knight d7 here, bishop d3, you take on c4, you force them to make a second move with the bishop, and then you play b5, you get another tempo for your development. White is going to move the bishop back somewhere, then you play bishop to b7. And then Dan, this is the most important thing, it's all about opening up this bishop. So if you don't get the move c5 in, you won't equalize, right? So how do you get c5 in? Well, you got to defend the b pawn, so you're going to play a6. a6 is going to be your next move. Then you can play like bishop d6, you can castle, you can play rook c8, you can put the bishop on e7 also if you want, but you got to play c5 in the position. That's your main and only plan. Sometimes you can play for e5 as well, but really it's all about c5. It's all about opening up this bishop on this diagonal. If you can do that, your position will be great. If not, you will very likely end up worse. So I hope that makes sense. That's all you need to know about this position when white goes like e3 and you get this kind of structure. You wait for them to move the bishop, take on c4, you go b5, bishop b7, you play a6, rook c8, you play c5, you open up the bishop and uh, all your pieces have, uh, have a lot of activity. Let's say white doesn't move the bishop out. How, what are you gonna do? For example, queen c2 here is a move people like to play. Then you just play bishop to d6. You're just making your, your useful moves and you're waiting for white to develop their bishop. Because eventually they're going to run out of moves. You're going to have to move this guy. They can't just wait for you to take on c4. Some players will try. They'll play like bishop d2, hoping you take on c4. Hey, just castle here. And then, okay, if they, keep, if they waste like a million moves, you can even play a6. You can even play this move ahead of time. And then finally they're going to go, okay, I'll play bishop e2, and then you snap take. <laughs> bishop takes c4, b5. Bishop goes back, bishop to b7, and then you're already ready to play c5 and rook c8, and the queen can go to e7 or b6 or c7. Lots of squares possible for the queen. Rook can go to e8. You can also play for e5. You actually won this game? That's crazy, Dan. I can't believe that. <laughs> you did not deserve to win that game. <laughs> So this is how you play these positions. Um, what I would encourage you to do, Dan, is I would look up the games of uh, Vichy Anand. Uh, Vichy has always been like one of the greatest semi-Slav uh, players in history, and he has a lot of brilliant, brilliant games. Um, I would look up his games. I would look up on, on YouTube, um, Vichy Anand, semi-Slav. Try to find the games that he played in this opening, play through them, analyze them, try to understand them. A lot of really, really good games, and, and that'll teach you how to how to play the opening. And this goes for everyone, guys. If you really want to learn how to play an opening, the main thing to do is find one or two players that were just absolute, you know, beasts in the in the opening and, and play through their games. Try to see the game in the opening through their eyes. How did they approach the position? What kind of plans did they implement? I mean, the blueprint is, is all there, guys. You know, it's all in the games. <laughs> These guys have been playing for years and years and years. They've mastered these openings. They've come up with some real brilliancies. And if you want to play like that, I mean, the best thing to do is to play through the games and try to internalize as many of those ideas uh, as you can. That was the main thing I did when I was learning openings, like when I was learning the King's Indian defense, 
I was looking at a lot of games by like King's Indian experts, um, like some of the classics like Gligorich and Geller, and then some like modern players like Nakamura and Grischuk and Rajabov, um, and just trying to play through as like as many games as I could and just trying to like analyze and, and pick up ideas. Um, and then once you do that, then you can start to think about like the theory. I think too many players, they focus on like learning opening theory, but that's not what it's really about, right? It's not really about like memorizing a bunch of moves. It's more about understanding the middle game that you're going to get and like how to play it and what to do with your pieces and what to do with the pawn breaks. So I hope that's <laughs> helpful for you guys. Um, we're kind of running out of time here, so I don't think we're going to get into uh, another game, but I hope that was an interesting show for everyone. I do like doing these game analysis shows because I feel like one game can be uh, instructive for more than one person uh, and everyone can kind of learn from it. If you want to catch the full episode, if you missed uh, the first part, it will be up on YouTube. And if you want to catch previous episodes, those will be up on my personal YouTube channel um, as well. Uh, and we have a lot, a lot of hours <laughs> going back at this point, so a lot of stuff um, to, to go on. Cool, Dan. Glad, glad to hear it was it was helpful. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, all right, guys. If you want to catch me uh, streaming again, I mainly stream from Chess Dojo Live's account. Um, so you can follow Chess Dojo Live on Twitch, uh, and that's where I mainly stream with a couple other uh, coaches: International Master David Pruis and Grandmaster Jesse Cry. I'm also on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, and uh, this show, uh, Peiko, is. Uh, streamed every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. So it's every Thursday, 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, 6.30 Eastern. Uh, and I think we're going to, I think we're going to stick to this format because I kind of like the, um, kind of like this more open format where people can submit like a bunch of games. We don't like spend too much time on any one game. We just kind of quickly go through a few key moments and I offer some thoughts. Um, yeah, the Twitch to follow is Chess Dojo Live, not to self-promote too much on <laughs> Chess 24's uh, Twitch, but that is where I mainly stream from. Uh, can I comment on what software I use to study chess and openings? Well, Joel, I've been using uh, Chess Base for, for many, many years now. I don't think that's the only way to study openings, but it's the one I've always been used to. Um, basically, working with like a big database, right? Finding games, using the engine to analyze those games, saving my analysis and yeah, trying to learn a thing or two about the, the different positions. Um, but nowadays there, there's tons of good software. I mean, Chess24, CoChess, Lee Chess, they all have like um, good ways of, of saving your analysis. So this isn't the only the only way to, to do things. Um, but yeah, guys, Thanks for tuning in. Always fun when, when the chat is active and, and there's lots of game submissions. Sorry I couldn't get to everyone today. I'll try to get through um, as many as I can uh, next week. Uh, so you just got to come back <laughs> and, uh, and submit early. Um, but yeah, guys, I'll be signing off for now. Hopefully everyone has good rest of your day. And I'll catch you guys next week. Take care.